Hello, hi, my name is Ryan, and welcome to another episode of Barefoot Poetry in the Park. In today's episode, I will be reading to you from my new used portable Poe. This has a selection of writings, essays, letters, and a few poems from the famous American poet, Edgar Allan Poe. Now, I am not a Poe expert, so I do apologize if my uh, pronunciation, if my ideas, if the depth of my knowledge is inadequate for your needs, but I will give you at least my honest opinion and an honest reading. And with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the poem alone. From childhood's hour I have not been, as others were, I have not seen. As others saw, I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From the same source, I have not taken my sorrow, I could not awaken. My heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Then in my childhood, in the dawn, of a most stormy life was drawn from every depth of good and ill. The mystery which binds me still from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue of a demon in my view. Okay, that, sorry guys, I kind of got lost in that imagery. Um, so that was Edgar Allan Poe's Alone, and I don't know a lot about it. I read online that he wrote it when he was about 20, 21 years old, and that it wasn't published until well after Edgar Allan Poe's death. So I wonder what that meant to him. I wonder if he didn't publish it because he didn't think it was adequate, if publishers rejected it, or it was a very personal one. Um, but I'll leave that for you to look up if you're that interested in it. I think that being alone is something that every human has experienced at least a few times in our life. And we, when we experience it for extended amounts of time, then our emotions come alive in ways that they never do when we're social and surrounded by people. Sometimes it's the thing that we fear the most to be alone. Sometimes it's the thing we crave more than anything to be alone when we have too many people around us giving us their opinions and whatnot. So I think the title and the topic is something we can all identify with. So I'll quickly go over some of the images and ideas that come to my mind. This is my own interpretation, um, so take it as you will. So he starts off, from childhood's hour I have not been, as others were I have not seen. As others saw, I could not bring my passions from a common spring. So ever since he was a child, basically as long as he can remember, he has not been as others were. So he's talking about, uh, it's not necessarily that he's physically alone, but he feels different. And you could be in a crowd of people, yet if you feel different, if you feel separated, um, and he talks about passions. His passions don't come from a common spring. So what makes him passionate is different from what the others find passionate. From the same source I have not taken, my sorrow I could not awaken, my heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved I loved alone. So since he was a child, he was different than the others. His passions were different. And also, the source of sorrow. It says, from the same source I have not taken, my sorrow I could not awaken. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I have, where everyone is really sad about something. It could be a basketball player's death. 
Um, and in LA recently, Kobe Bryant died and, you know, on Facebook, everyone was really sad. Um, and, you know, I don't like to hear about people's death, but I didn't really have an emotional attachment and I did feel a little alone in that, in a certain way. Um, there's a lot of things that sometimes I just don't, my sorrow and my passion don't come from, I guess, the common source. He uses the term spring um, and source. Sometimes what makes me happy, what makes you happy is different from the general public, from the normal person. Um, and then when that happens, when everyone around you is sad about something or everyone around you is passionate about something, maybe it's the World Cup and you don't care about soccer, um, then you feel a little alone. Now, I think that as humans, we have this amazing ability to mimic and sometimes we just go along and pretend we're sad or pretend we're happy. And, and actually, we can actually feel it because um, I may not know this person who died, but someone who tells me if I have enough empathy and they tell it in a heartfelt way, then I can feel their pain. But it doesn't always happen. You know, um, I think when it comes to emotions, something that uh, needs to be said more often is that they're not necessarily controllable. You can't command yourself to be sad and you can't command yourself to be happy. They happen spontaneously. And um, I think Edgar Allan Poe, as a uh, famous genius and an author was someone who was extremely honest if if not anything else and he says my heart to joy at the same tone and all i loved i loved alone so the tone of joy for you whether it's going to the candy shop or watching uh your favorite tv program that tone that vibration that emotion that mood Edgar Allen, his heart doesn't go to that tone. His joy doesn't go to that tone with the people around him. Then in my childhood, in the dawn of a most stormy life was drawn from every depth of good and ill, the mystery which binds me still. That's an interesting image. Um, let's, let's think about this together. I haven't really analyzed this in depth before this video. So then in my childhood in the dawn, so basically at the beginning of his childhood, of a most stormy life was drawn. So we could imagine that he probably didn't have a very nice childhood. Now, I did a cursory glance at his Wikipedia page and saw that um, his father abandoned him and his mother. And shortly after that, his mother died, I think at an extremely early age, maybe even one years old, you know, basically. Um, and I think he went to live with another relative and that was a stormy relationship. So, you know, we consider it a stormy relationship, even if your parents divorce, but this is, you know, your father abandoning you, um, and then your mother dying. And that's, uh, that's enough for a stormy life. That's enough for some deep emotions that may even prevent you from certain joys or taking part in the common common man's uh, excitement you know if you have these sort of emotional sorrows i'm not saying that he did i'm just uh you know contemplating this out loud um from every depth of good and ill the mystery which binds me still so in the dawn of his childhood from this stormy life was drawn from every depth of good and ill. So all of the de all of the good, all of the bad, the ill, it all comes from this source. And what is it? The mystery which binds me still. So it see, so what is a mystery? It's something that is unknown. It is something that we are aware of. It is something that affects us but we can't put our fingers on it. I don't know if you've ever had this. Some, it could be that you have an extreme joy. You're not sure why you're happy. It's a mystery. You, are, you have a depression. You're not sure why. It's a mystery. There could be factors in your life that you're unaware of. 
And when it's, when you're unaware of some influence, you know, like a dark matter, I mean, that, maybe that's a bad analogy, but what is causing this push towards good or ill? It's the mystery which binds me still. So he's still affected from this. He's no longer in the dawn of his childhood, but he is still affected by this mystery. Let's see if we can find out what it is. The mystery which binds me still from the torrent or the fountain, from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by. So it doesn't matter if his, it says from the torrent or the fountain. What's the difference between a torrent and a fountain? A torrent is just an amazing amount of amorphous liquid or emo emotion flying by. It's uncontrollable. It is strong. It is powerful. A fountain, a fountain is more orderly. So it could be he's talking about his life, his emotions, whether or not it's stormy and chaotic like a torrent or it's orderly or a fountain from the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it passed me flying by. So basically, doesn't matter if it's a torrent or a fountain, doesn't matter if it's the red cliff, doesn't matter if it's the golden sun going over, doesn't matter if it's the lightning in the sky passing him flying by, from the thunder and the storm and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. Now, I, I find um, that last line of a demon in my view is the critical line in my interpretation of this entire poem. Because he starts off talking about how he's not like other people. Whether we're talking about joy or sorrow. Whether we're talking about uh, torrents or fountains. Whether you're on the mountain or looking at the sun or the lightning bolt flying by doesn't matter he's different from other people and what the source of his difference the source of this mystery he looks and he sees in the blue sky what does he say he says and the cloud that took the form when the rest of heaven was blue of a demon in my view one interesting thing about clouds, and we all know this if you ever take the time to just look at clouds, is it's sort of like a Rorschach blot. That's that blast of ink on a paper where your subconscious sort of identifies various shapes and emotions that are meaningful to you. It's sort of a way to allow your subconscious. Subconscious by that, I mean the emotions and thoughts that are sort of below the conscious awareness. We have all these ideas and emotions and memories from our life that, you know, sometimes spring out of the blue. And sometimes when you just watch clouds, it's, this is what psychologists would say, the depth psychologists anyways of the 20th century, um, that it allows your unconscious or your, the part of your mind that creates fantasies to project onto these shapes. What does he see when he looks, when the rest of heaven was blue and the cloud that takes the form of a demon in his view? A demon. Is the demon the mystery? Is the demon the source of his aloneness? Now, um, the reason I think it is, is there's been an idea that's been very interesting to me. Um, so, first of all, what is a demon? We all know, for, if you're from the West, the Judeo-Christian interpretation of what a demon is, and that's this evil henchman of the devil that is always trying to guide you in the wrong direction, that might be sabotaging your life, that is whispering into your ear all sorts of temptations. And, and I'm not going to say that that's wrong, but just to imagine or to go back to some of the different interpretations of what a demon was. Um, and if you look up demon in the dictionary, you'll see that there's different definitions. Now, demon, uh, there's an alternative spelling. It's D-A-E-M-O-N. Um, I've heard people pronounce it daimon, uh, but I've heard it also pronounced dictionary.com demon. And it's a variant spelling of demon. Why am I saying all this? Well, the Greeks 
believe that we all have a demon, a tutelary demon. This demon, it's, it's not an evil power in the Greek conception. It's an intermediate being between the divine and humans. And its goal is to tell you how to live or to give you advice, to save your life. Um, Socrates, uh, Plato writes about Socrates having and consulting his demon. Um, and this was a really, this wasn't some obscure thing. This was a really strong belief that we all have this, this divine intermediary that gives us information. And it was also perceived, I believe, as a source of creativity. Now, when we come to the Romans, they had this idea of a genius. Everyone has a genius. Even cities have a genius. And the genius is basically the same element. And from my understanding, the Greek demon and the Roman genius are the same or they've at least become so intermingled that they are basically synonyms of each other. There's probably subtle differences between those. You can correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. Um, but one thing, now these terms aren't very popular these days, at least the way that we use them. We still use the word demon and we use the word genius, but not in the way that I'm talking about. So if you read a lot of writers uh, from the 1800s, this is how I stumbled upon it. I started reading Thoreau. I started reading Emerson and they kept talking about my genius. I consult my genius in the morning. I do only what my genius wants me to do. And I'm thinking, what does that mean? And I started to look into it and sure enough, it's this like, it's like this voice in your ear or in your heart or it's your intuition or it's your gut instinct. I don't know what we would use as our modern equivalent, my guess would be intuition, um, but it's this divine source of information that you better listen to. And if you want to produce anything that's authentic from your life, you listen from something deep inside of you. So that maybe that's the best way to describe it because we all know that we have these dreams when we're children. You have a dream, a really powerful urge. You are drawn to a very specific genre or art and it, there's something inside you that just desires it beyond anything else. Now, the idea of a genius is someone who has that in abundance. Their attraction could be for music, for paint, for other mediums of their choice. Not their choice, from their genius's choice or their demon's choice. They are drawn to it and if they persist, the voice of the genius, the voice of the demon gets louder and it's control over your life. You sort of lose your own volition. I believe if you look at some of the biographies of a lot of geniuses, whether we're talking about uh, in the sciences or in art, that a lot of them felt compelled to do their work, compelled to write down um, their theorems, that they had it, sudden flashes in dreams or uh, like a voice dictating to them it's sort of the esoteric story but behind a lot of geniuses and go ahead and look into this this stuff is uh, abounding throughout the centuries um at least uh, in western thought and emerson thoreau lots of other uh, writers and uh, poe is also from the 1800s and he has um chap he has essays on genius and he talks about his genius now, in this poem alone, he uses that demon in my view. And like I said, the demon is like the Greek version of the genius. And the genius or the demon, both of them, sort of goad you on towards its own intentions. It, it, it's like it's the idea of like fate or destiny. I mean, you really are believing in a higher power when you use these terms. Um, at least, it, or in psychological terms, a higher power from your unconscious, perhaps. Um, but it could be that the reason Edgar Allan Poe was a genius, the reason he was a genius, is the same reason that he was alone and felt alone. And his joy didn't spring from a common spring. His joy didn't go to the same tone. His sadness, he was alone could be the reason he was a genius and the reason he was alone was for the same comes from the same exact source and it was this demon this source this voice this thing inside of him that from the dawn of his childhood has been 
there's even an idea that so this this is really kind of crazy it's very different from our rational materialistic reductionist uh mythology that we um propagate today but people did believe that your genius was not just a you know a nice voice or a hunch in your head it also I don't know it had some effect in the exterior world and it conspired so for example if your genius wanted you to be a painter but um someone was in your way then suddenly that person would get sick and fall out of your way because the genius has there's this divine plan it's like the the yarn of necessity and fate is being if you if you follow it, it gets stronger and stronger until all obstacles move out of your way. It's almost like you're a, an actor in nature's cosmic dance and your genius is sort of your guide to the song that you're supposed to be playing. And um, Edgar Allan Poe, at least, I mean, like I said, I'm not an expert, but I've read a little bit what he said about genius because I find that topic fascinating. There is a book, if you like this topic, written by James Hillman, called the soul's code it's either the soul code or the soul's code james hillman he was a very popular uh psychologist in the latter half of the 20th century and um, this book is all about the demon or the genius and it gives a little bit of history about that and a lot of examples of how the how many people uh many famous people as well as normal people's lives are always influenced by this mysterious force in our life um, and one thing that it did that it did say was that um, some people especially people that go on to do incredible works that are so beautiful and so magnificent their genius their demon is particularly powerful but we all have it but sometimes most of us we don't listen to it we, or it gets beaten out of us in our education. We listen to what society wants. We lose the voice from the genius. We lose the voice from the demon. And then we're just doing something that actually our soul doesn't want us to do. And we go, why am I depressed? Oh, I forgot about that thing inside of me that had another idea. In any case, that was Edgar Allan Poe's Alone with a probably a very unique interpretation not saying that it's the correct one but it is mine honestly to you barefoot poetry in the park i hope you guys had a nice day um and if you liked it please click like or subscribe and if not that's cool hope you guys have a beautiful day my wife took the cocker spaniel around the park and i'm gonna go see where she is bye